we never get tired of talking matter sports in the entire world but obviously what is happening in Kenya and our continent Africa but right now I want to discuss about football development in Africa with an expert in the sector Brian Wesala founder and CEO of Football Foundation for Africa good to see you man how are you doing uh, I'm doing very well Maxwell thank you very much for, for having me today thank, thank you for coming time. through you were in Rwanda the other day when did you travel back uh, I traveled back uh, on uh, on Sunday I actually got back to Kenya on Sunday morning what was really happening in Rwanda? Rwanda has been a beehive of activities lately as far as sports is concerned. Hosting, you know, basketball championship and, you know, a lot of conferences taking place. Mm -hmm. President Paul Kagame has been passionate about sports. Is it also attributed to him, his love for the sport? Uh, I think uh, Rwanda is one of the few countries in, uh, in Africa who have realized the, the, the potential of sports and uh, specifically the business side of it. So they are they're pushing a lot uh, uh, sports tourism. So selling Rwanda as a desti destination for sports tourism. Uh, I think they also have in place a very comprehensive uh, sports development policy, which was launched last, last year that uh, they are trying to, to, to develop. And uh, this is one of the reasons I was also there to explore uh, opportunities. Maybe I'll share more about that uh, later in the, in the show. But uh, yeah, Rwanda is becoming um, a sports destination uh, on the continent and they are packaging themselves in that way. Are they embracing their, you know, sports initiatives programs being launched to ensure that growth and development of the sport is on another level? Mm, you can see a lot uh, with the, what they are doing, especially in uh, in basketball. Yes, yes. Hosting the high level events from uh, NBA Africa and this kind of thing. So. Uh, these kind of things bring resources, they bring uh, the needed visibility to the, to the country and uh, you also know the partnerships they have for example with Arsenal and PSG, yes. uh, Visit Rwanda. Uh, so this is all in line with, uh, with sports uh, tourism and how they are trying to package themselves. So it's a matter of attracting resources to the country uh, to develop sports and uh, from Kagame himself he understands the value of sports in terms of uh, a platform for human development. So that's very much part of their sports development uh, policy. And it will be interesting to see how they progress in the next um, uh, five to ten years because their, their policy was launched, relaunched last year and they have a ten-year plan. And what would be interesting for me as well to see if other countries can follow suit or borrow from what Rwanda is doing uh, to, uh, to promote, to develop sports in their own countries. Being a patriotic Kenya, I know you mean well for Kenya. Mm -hmm. As a country where you come from, you want it to thrive as far as sports and football development is concerned. African Cup of Nations is currently happening, but Kenya is not participating. As someone who forms an integral part as far as ensuring that, you know, football grows and gets to another level, not only in African continent, but the entire world. Do you think whatever you've been advocating for and pushing the initiative has been borrowed to be incorporated in Kenyan system? Kenyan system. Uh, so what I've been uh, advocating for of pushing is more investment into grassroots football uh, on the continent, of course, starting with Kenya. Um, because I think this is, really, this is really critical. When you see uh, what is happening at AFCO and the countries that are there, of course, some of the, the countries there are uh, what you call traditional powerhouses. They yes. rarely miss out. But at the same time, we have other powerhouses that are uh, at home. It's not only Kenya, South Africa, DRC, Zambia. They have all missed out on, uh, on, on AFCON. But um, AFCON for me is the platform where you get to show the work that you have been doing over the years. So if you look at the countries that have uh, made it, the likes of uh, Cape Verde, uh, Comoros, uh, they, they have very uh, long-term strategies that involve development of the grassroots, you see. And that is something that uh, over time uh, Kenya and even the continent as a whole has fallen back. If you look at Kenya in the, early, in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, Kenya was a football powerhouse on the continent. We made it to the 1988 AFCON, 1990 AFCON, and this AFCON had only eight teams. 1992 as well, we made it there and there were only 12 teams. So Kenya was a powerhouse, but uh, after that, from 1994, things started to change a bit um, in the sports space. Um, you can indirectly attribute some of it to, to, to politics, uh, which are issues of governance, are very important that we start uh, looking at how we manage sport, how we govern sport, who gets. I think early on the show people talk about getting the right leaders in place. So these are some of the things where Kenya has fallen back in terms of development. It's not an issue that there is no talent in the country. It's how do we manage this talent so that um, it, uh, it gets to the highest level. So, 
since the mid 90s until 2004 when we made it again to 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 afcon uh, after beating cape Verde here uh, not much has been done in terms of developing the sport from the grassroots level and i also say it's important that we be seen to develop the sport as a business because things have moved uh, from when uh, football was very amateurish now football is business you see, when we talk about football development, people will not only pro uh, probably think about coaches, uh, referees, but how are we managing our clubs, for example, from the, right from the grass? Which are these uh, economically, socially viable entities? I think we need a more holistic approach when it comes to football development. We need to make it relevant to the society in which we are in. Government needs to invest. The private sector needs to invest. And if we don't get especially the governance aspects of football right, then um, we turn away investors uh, from, uh, from football. And this is the challenge we have now. We made it to the 2019 AFCON, but for me that was not, um, it was not something that we should be proud of per se. We all know what happened with Sierra Leone being uh, um, banned from, uh, by, by, by FIFA. Um, and it was more of a, a case of chance rather than merit that we made it to 2019 AFCON. But we can attribute all this to our failure to develop the sport uh, holistically right from the uh, grassroots. And this is um, something I, I, I keep saying, and that's why the reasons I set up the Football Foundation for Africa, to work directly with grassroots football communities, so academies, clubs, and other organizations using football in one way uh, or the other. Because the way the industry is structured go uh, globally, resources are distributed top down and when this happens it really gets to the bottom of the of the pyramid so the federations they'll get the money they'll try to put in place the program but by the time it reaches to that club uh, at the grassroots there is very few resources that's why you have uh, little happening in terms of infrastructure development even the coaching education that we have is not reaching as many coaches as it should um, the clubs uh, um, at the bottom there, they don't have sponsors because they, they have not been trained in the business of sports. How do they package themselves so that they can attract even the local businesses, the local communities to come and support them? So it's really shifting our focus away from just thinking of football as talent development, coaching developing, refereeing development, to a more holistic approach and seeing how can we use football as a platform uh, to develop young people so that uh, corporates can come in, international development agencies can come in. So how do we get more resources to the grassroots level in Kenya? And the continent? Excellent insights as far as uh, football development at Mashinani grassroots is concerned, especially in investment in the sports. Because I think we all know that is where you and I understand, that is where people are passionate about football, plenty of untapped potential, but we lack policies and structures. And you know people mistake football investment and development at Mashinani for, you know, these tournaments that happen during December holidays. Mm -hmm. You know, someone staging a competition, then waiting for another year to uh, do another one without continuity of these players who've graced, you know, these competitions. Mm -hmm. Is it high time now, you know, those people who are at the helm of football management, governance aspect of the sport, can consider that, you know, it's high time policies, structures at the grassroots level are enhanced to ensure that, you know, we get to another stage? Um, I think uh, policies have always been there. We are always developing uh, policies and, uh, and launching uh, policies. Uh, for me, the challenge usually is, uh, is in implementation of these uh, policies. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter how good a document we ca you come up with. If you don't have the people to colorful blueprint, no execution, no execution, and execution is a is, is a matter of people. You know, we know more. We need more people in sports, in football, not only passionate people, but also knowledgeable people. You know, uh, for a long time in Africa, especially sports management has not developed. Sports management education is is lacking because football was not being treated as an, as an industry. It was more of a leisure activity as a pastime. And therefore, we did not develop, we have not developed the knowledge to support the growth of the industry. We have not developed the right professionals to support the growth of the industry. You look at football, for example, a lot of, of, the, of, the, of the managers or the administrators you have there are doing it more of, as a side job or, or as a part-time. 
this is what I do, but I also double up as a chairman of a certain club. This is what I do, but uh, I'm also um, a chairman of a sub-branch uh, somewhere in, uh, uh, in the country. So we don't have enough full-time professionals, sports management professionals, to run the industry. And it's because also the industry has not been paying um, as it um, yeah, other professions. So it's, it's a difficult situation to be in, but I think it's high time we get more people who can manage football on the continent. And these people should be dedicated to the management of sports, the management of football uh, on the continent. And not doing it as a, as a part-time or for other reasons. You see the tournaments that are organized now, usually it's uh, political. Uh, right now there's a lot of uh, polit uh, politics going on in the country. So we'll find politicians organizing tournaments for young people. Yeah, this is good. But as you rightly point out... And saying that they want to nurture talent. Exactly. I think that has been a misused phrase lately. It, 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 it's a misused phrase, especially by, 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 by politicians. But we need those resources. But as you rightly point out, there is no continuity. You know, after this election period, then what, what happens after? Who will be there? That's why I think we need more players who are dedicated to the development of sport, the development of football in the country, who can have the right knowledge as well because we have very few people who are trained in sports management and those who are trained are not even working in the field or they're not being given the chance to run uh, the critical institutions uh, that are responsible for the, for, from the, uh, for the development of sports. There is a problem bedeviling Kenya especially when it comes to matters elections of uh, sporting federations. You know former f players want to rise to the occasion and get elected uh, to be at the helm to serve as administrators in our federations, football, FKF, Athletics, Kenya, AK, Kenya Rugby Union, KRU. Mm -hmm. And they always say that, you know, it has to be given to me because I'm a former player. Not distinguishing the aspect of you being a former player and being a football manager are two different things. Patrick Motepe, for example, the man in charge of CAF, Confederation of African Football, I think he's the owner or president of Mamelodi Sundowns as well, is a man whose business, you know, uh, expertise is on another level and he must have also done football development as a course as something he pursued in an institution how do we infiltrate that you know into kenyan f uh, football minds that you know you don't need to be uh, a good manager for having played football sometimes we get good managers not from football background mm -hmm. because right now as we speak FKF caretaker committees, uh, six months is almost elapsing and we will be having elections. People will be standing for elections and you will see former players, most of them vying for presidency, saying that, you know, it has to be given to me because I played football for national team. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, that's, that's, that's a challenge we have. And I will challenge these players to, to come out and not just saying we deserve these uh, leadership positions but to show us how they are going to contribute to the development of the sport. Can they come up with strategic plans uh, that will be implemented, for example? And uh, again, this goes back to how we develop, especially players from the grassroots level. You know, in, uh, in Africa, in Kenya, sometimes I, f I feel, or rather my opinion is, the industry has been misold to us. So you have people who are really focusing on being footballers at the expense probably of their education. You find most of our players after high school probably they did not pursue an education further and they focused on football. Which means um, it's okay for those who make it in football. And they make it to a certain level where they're able to earn from the sport. But you and me know these are very few. There's a very low percentage of players who are earning sustainable uh, income from playing football. Uh, so what I've been advocating for is some kind of dual career. Yes, you're pursuing your football professionally, but it's also important that you pursue your education so that even after playing, you can come back to the federation and see, I was a player, but I also have this diploma and this and this, and therefore I can contribute to the development of this game. But most of these players, honestly, cannot. They have some inherent skills by virtue of having played at the, at the highest level, for example. Leadership skills, they have them. Teamwork, they already have them. Communication, they have these skills. 
but they do not have the technical know-how to manage the sport. They are not managers uh, per se. So that's, that's, the, that's, that's the challenge we have and I would challenge players right from an early age to consider, uh, not to consider football as a career, but consider it as a tool that they have for a certain duration and then uh, they have to move on to other things. Because most players by 35, 34, especially here in Africa, you have to stop playing. What do you do then? Not all of them can be coaches, but a lot of them could be managers, for example, if they had the right education. Look at what has happened in, uh, in Cameroon now. Eto has taken over the, the, the running of the federation. One, he is confident. He commands a lot of international attention. But at the same time, he has taken time to develop his education or his management skills through education. And therefore, when he stands up and says, I want to take over the leadership of football in this country, he has all the credentials it takes. But how many of our former players can do the same? Uh, how many of our former players can, uh, can say that? And, and this is a challenge. The players that we have now, they should already, even as they are playing, start thinking about that future of what they want to do after football or even during their football and be able to package themselves in that way. Uh, somebody like Motsepe, um, for him to get to the calf level, of course, his business acumen is top-notch. Yes. Very influential person in, uh, in South Africa. And you know at that level also it's about influence. Yes, yes. How much can you influence, you know? Yeah. Uh, as with his connection, he can probably bring more resources into the, con uh, into the continent's football. Uh, but at the same time, I think um, we need people who are entirely dedicated to the management of football and that's why I think it's important for a person like Motsepe to have a very strong secretariat. Same here at the national level. You know you can be at the presidential level and uh, maybe for you it was by virtue of your influence. But what kind of SG do you have in place? What kind of CEO do you have in place? Is this I think it's the same thing Jan Infantino, FIFA president has been doing ensuring that in this you know member countries there is federations that are strong to you know, support his cause to ensure that football at the global stage is enhanced. And you talked about a very critical aspect of, you know, players, besides, you know, their football career, they can have an alternative mm -hmm. uh, thing. We've seen the likes of, you know, Alan Wanga, former player. He yeah. played for several clubs locally, FC Leopards, and he played for the national team. And right now, as we speak, he's the sports director at the Kakamega County. After, you know, announcing his retirement, parting ways with Kakamega homeboys, it is something that, you know, we, we can't fail to take home. Uh, Anthony Modo Kimani, he also played for Madara United FC Leopards. He got injured at, you know, the tender age 24. His football career got crippled, paralyzed. But he had, see, he had something on the side. And that's what we've been seeing, the likes of Bonfa Sambani, you know, Simon Mulama. Not forgetting our very own former captain for the national team, Muso Tieno. Those guys are top pundits on TV when it comes to matters football analysis. It is something that we see with Didier Drogba. You know, at an international level, Didier is moderating a session that a gala night that has to award Ballon d'Or, you know, winners. I think it is something that our footballers, like you said, have to emulate. But as a, as a stakeholder, what do they say when you tell them so? Mm. I think most, uh, most are open uh, to the idea because nowadays I interact with players a lot, especially at, uh, at the grassroots level. I think they, they see it, but still... There is that aspect of reluctance. A reluctance, you know, and it's because uh, of what football is. I, I am a footballer myself, so I understand what oh, it means. Oh, you played football? I, I played football up to national, at the NSL level uh, here. So by then I was playing for Strathmore University FC. And you, you, you can see the passion that is there. You know, when you talk about Africa, we always talk about passion, talent. We want to be footballers. But the reality on the ground is that there are not enough professional uh, opportunities for footballers on the continent. So two things have to happen. One, players have to fashion themselves differently so that they have this dual ap approach to their career. And then as an industry, we also need to start thinking more holistically, as I said before. We need to start seeing what other opportunities are there in the industry. You know, one professional player, uh, for example, if you talk about Europe, you can find he's employing about 20 people indirectly to support him. There is physiotherapists, there is lawyers, there is statisticians. How come in Africa we have not taken time to look at what other opportunities are there? 
to support the development of sports. I mean, we need researchers in the game. Because I, doesn't need, I don't need to, to be a player to be part of the team. I can be a physiotherapist. Exactly. And you still get to work very closely to your passion because it's, it's all about passion uh, at some time, uh, most of the time. If you can be a researcher and you're giving us d data to, on how football is developing on the continent, then there is a huge opportunity for, uh, for that. You know, the participation, in, uh, uh, participation level um, in Africa are very high. But nobody is taking the time to even quantify and informing the continent of the economic potential of the sport. And this should be the work of an economist. So imagine a situation where you have an econ economist who is also passionate about football and is able to give us direction on how and why we need to invest in football. Right now you go to a lot of companies, they will ask you, okay, you want us to support you, you want to support your organization, you want us to support your tournament, but so what's the return on investment for us? Because everybody is looking for a return. Then that's where the conversation usually drops. You know, our federations, they have a product like the national team, but they are unable to package it to our corporates to sell it. That needs investment in good sports management education, marketing education, sponsorship education. A lot of research happens around in these spaces. But in Africa, we haven't done enough or we haven't even started doing much. Yourself, you've said that you are in Strathmore. And Strathmore is one of the institutions that is good at offering scholarships to those people who, who exhibit uh, enormous talent as far as sports is concerned, football, basketball, rugby. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think, you know, Sports stakeholders locally can collaborate and partner with these institutions, the likes of Daystar, you know, the likes of Catholic University of East Africa, mm -hmm. to ensure that, you know, our sportsmen, we get to recognize them. Because sometimes you can blame our footballers. Someone wants to play for, let's say, Mother United, just an example, get some few coins so that feeds his family and also use the remaining one to educate himself. But, you know, it's not enough. So how can there be a collaboration and concrete partnership of our institutions and local sports stakeholders so that, you know, the provision of scholarship programs can continue to empower our sportsmen academically? Um, I think that is something that uh, I have seen, I think, over the last, uh, even while I was here, over the last 10 years, that some institutions are doing very well. Uh, Strathmore University has a very good sports uh, scholarship program. Um, I think even uh, MKU, uh, they do it. A lot of our universities are, are, are offering these uh, things. So you find uh, someone is pursuing the uh, Bachelor of Commerce and uh, they're also playing for, uh, for, the, for the university team. Uh, but after university, uh, what happens then? You see, a lot of these people, they, they would stop playing or when they start pursuing their, their careers, uh, they, they stop playing. And most of them don't even contribute back to the sport. You see, it was basketball, it was football that afforded you a scholarship. But uh, once you are done with that, then that's that. But if these people uh, can see that they need the expertise they have gained as a marketing expert, they can come back and support uh, football, I think that, ca that should be encouraged. To further cement uh, the, uh, the partnerships between sports and our institution, I think these are the, also the places that should be doing research. I know in, uh, in Kenya currently it's only KU that is known for sports. And even their sports, uh, what they uh, give as a sports management program is not highly developed. Um, and how closely do they work, for example, with our federations? You know, you could be running sports management programs and sports management research, but is the industry consuming? Is, uh, is the Federation, for example, calling on experts uh, at KU, professors of sports and this kind of thing, to help them in drawing up their strategies? You know, one of the things I realized after uh, venturing into, into football as, um, uh, from the development side, we have so many sports management scholars from Africa, but based outside the continent, because our industry was not consuming, or rather is not consuming what they can produce. So one of the things I've been trying to do is to bring these people to support the growth of the industry on the continent. 
and uh, I run a show, I think we should be starting next month, the Africa Football Business Show. I try to bring people from academia, people from industry and see how do we create a conversations, those interactions that can feed into the development of the industry. Because it shouldn't be a, a, a case of guesswork. You know, sometimes I say, when we say, okay, we are passionate, we are talented, it also becomes a game of chance. You know, we might find ourselves at AFCON in 2023, but are we able to replicate that in 2025? Probably not, because what we did was to was chance. But if you're investing in proper um, knowledge creation and dissemination structures, then you can know, okay, we did not qualify for 2021. Why? Because of this and this and this. This is what we tried and this failed. Like so, it is something that has happened in, Ken in Ghana. I was reading some press release this particular morning. Mm -hmm. Ministry of Sports for Ghanaian government has summoned a stakeholders meeting involving football mm -hmm. officials to ask what really transpired in Cameroon for the elimination at the group stage. Something that has never happened, I think, in the previous year. So going back to the drawing board and establishing a future, yeah. you know. What went wrong Yes. and what do we do moving forward? Because you can't get to a point where, okay, we have failed, but you don't know what went wrong. Simply because you do not, do not have a proper plan in place. See, when you have a plan, then you know where the plan did not work and you try to correct. And it might not work even the second time, the third time. So, you know, what, what do we change? So that's, that's I think, is where our, our, our sports has been uh, struggling. That's where our football has been struggling. We need to get uh, more professionals on the board. We need to get the research tanks in place so that we have a more knowledge-driven industry as opposed to just passion-driven uh, industry. So what's the future of football in Africa as a continent? Are we progressive? Are we getting somewhere? Um, judging by AFCON, I think we are, we are doing well. Mm -hmm. um, so we've not had uh, enough platforms on the continent to discuss football development. And for me, I also say now football enterprise development because we need to start looking at football as an enterprise. Um, also, the discussion of football on the continent has been restricted to very closed uh, spaces. And uh, that is something as the Football Foundation for Africa I'm trying to address. And that's why I was in, uh, I was in Kigali. So later this year, we'll be organizing uh, the first Africa Football Business Summit. And this will be a multi-stakeholder platform um, bringing together government, private sector, uh, the federations, clubs. Let's have one platform where we can start to talk about an agenda for African football. And uh, let's involve everyone. The, uh, the plan is to make it a biennial event so that in between the two years, we can also take stock of what we are doing. You know, accountability is also one of the challenges we, uh, we have. How are we accountable to ourselves? So those symp symposiums, people discuss and uh, they go away. No, we, Sometimes we, uh, <laughs> people discuss, then after they have left the conference halls, nothing, nothing is implemented. No follow-up. So we are trying to create something different, something agenda-driven, so that in two years' time we can come and say, this is what happened in 2022. Where are we in 2024 in terms of developing the Africa football industry? And um, I think... By creating this independent platform, Africa will start also having a voice in the development of football. Because right now we are, we, are, we are the biggest consumers of football, in my opinion, as a continent. But we do not have a strong voice. The football agenda has mainly been driven by Europe. Because that's where the industry is most developed. But how do we, how do we change that? Or how do we make Africa stronger in the football space? So these are some of the discussions we need to start having. How do we strengthen the African sports ecosystem so that we'll be seen to playing at the almost um, equal level as Europe. I'm not saying we create a football that looks like European football. But economically, I think if we uh, organize ourselves well, then we can start to contribute more towards the, um, the global agenda. And uh, you just mentioned the idea of players even uh, being stopped from traveling back. This is all an issue of economic value, you know? These players are being played huge amounts of money, uh, sala, money. So their clubs have taken a financial risk. And that's why they will stop and say, no, we don't want to release our players for two weeks. We or their respective uh, tacticians can fake an injury on a player. Exactly, they will fake injuries and these kind of things. But it's because they're looking at the economic um, uh, value. The AFCON vis-a-vis what they're getting at their clubs, you know. 
they were saying uh, the European Championships, which is played all, every four years, is almost 20 times uh, um, worth uh, the value of AFCON. That's in financial returns. So you see those kind of conversations, we're not having them. So how do we grow the economic value of AFCON, for example, so that even as a tournament, it is respected? Uh, so that when money is called to go and play for Senegal, he doesn't even have to think twice. When Salah is called, they don't have to think twice. You know, in all this conversation, they have been quiet. The players themselves, they haven't talked. It's the Ian Wright, it's the Patrick Freas, but the players, they know. They know. They are, the players, they know. This is what our club is investing in us, going to AFCON. It's like doing your country a favor, or they'll say it's patriotism. So, but it shouldn't have, it so, doesn't, so, doesn't have so, to do that. So way. money supersedes patriotism, because at the club level, they are heavily paid, and like at the national team level where, you know, you have to offer patriotic assignments to your team. Someone, like in the past, during Sam Nyamuya's era, you've been there, as far as African football is concerned, players used to foot their, their own flight team. charges yeah. to travel back to yeah. represent Kenya. Yeah, I think um, we, we have to be honest and say um, there's only so much you can do out of patriotism and love for your country. But it gets to a point where you're saying, where does it make sense for me to invest myself? And that's why we see all African players want to to leave and play in Europe at some point. I, my dream, or rather my goal, is one day uh, players will just want to play in Africa because it offers more or less the same economic Alex opportunities. Alex is back in Africa uh, playing for a side in Djibouti. In, in Djibouti, you know, because the financial uh, rewards are there. I think it's, it's the best run. Um, what is the secret behind this fast-rising profile of clubs in Djibouti? In, uh, I think it's only this one club. It's called Sol, Sol or something. Um, um, but yeah, you have to look at who owns it uh, and this kind of thing. You know, we have, we have these, um, we have big businessmen sometimes. They get behind a club, they put in their money, usually just uh, as, a, um, as a, what do you say, as a toy. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not really like they're looking for a return from, uh, from the club, but we need to move beyond that. But ha how do we attract uh, more Alex Song back to the continent to make our football more entertaining, to pull more fans uh, to, uh, to the stadium? I think those are the questions we need to start uh, asking ourselves over the year and we make it consistent as you put it out. It's not just a one-off, you know. AFCON will be over on February 6th. We have to go back to our leagues. Our league is attractive. Look at East Africa. No representation. Uh, when I talk about East Africa, I talk about Sekafa. No representation at, uh, at the AFCON, apart from um, uh, Ethiopia, who have already been uh, kicked out. As the region sat down as, uh, and uh, tried to determine how come we are not able to, to qualify, can we collaborate as a region to find solutions, for example? The Af AFCON has been expanded to 24 teams, but still no team from the East African community. Where is the problem? So if we don't start asking our, ourselves these critical questions, then we'll always find ourselves complaining. Our oh, football is being poorly run, football is corruption, but we cannot complain forever. We need to start to come up with solutions. We need to identify where we are going wrong so that we can move forward. Where is the problem? Africa right now, 24 teams taking part, no one from East Africa representing this subcontinent. Of course, that has been the parting shot for Brian Wesala, the CEO and founder for Fo Football Foundation for Africa. Quality conversation and thank you for coming through. It's been an interesting, you know, discussion and we look forward to having more of this going forward, right? Thank you very much, Maxwell. It was a pleasure to be here and I definitely look forward to coming back and uh, informing you of uh, our projects and uh, our programs. And uh, yeah, it's always a pleasure. Sure, sure, sure. Of course, Touchline continues. Of course, it's the end of the show, but continues on social media platforms. Hashtag Touchline Y254 to CK Maxwell at Touchline Y254. Where is the problem as far as African football, especially in East Africa? is concerned because right now the tournament in Cameroon is ongoing African Cup of Nations, but Ethiopia, which was, you know, our sole representative, has been already eliminated. Kenya, unfortunately, not taking part. Of course, it's the discussion that continues online, but it's been a pleasure having you on board. Thank you for tuning in Saturday next time, same time, same place. Hope to see you again. Keep, you know, ensuring that you comply with the guidelines as far as COVID-19 pandemic is concerned so that we can combat this international monster. Thank you for tuning in. God bless. Peace. And have a nice weekend.